Hello everyone, uh, my name is Ye, I'm the co-founder of Scroll. Uh, I do research about ZK hardware acceleration and uh, ZK proof system. Today I'm going to talk about ZK VM design, optimization, and applications. I will try to give a comprehensive overview of ZK VM, explain what is it, how we are building it, some challenges we met, um, and some other interesting applications that use ZK VM besides us. Uh, before diving into more detail, just a quick introduction of us. So what is Scroll? In short, Scroll is a scaling solution for Ethereum. Um, in other words, we are building a general purpose layer 2 platform that inherits security from Ethereum, but can be much cheaper, faster, with the highest throughput. Um, and more specifically, we are building an EVM equivalent ZK rollup. So firstly, we are building a ZK rollup solution um, it's considered to be the most secure scaling solution based on zero knowledge proof. Um, second, we can support EVM inside our ZK rollup. It's not only a specific smart contract proving language like Solidity, but we can achieve a deeper level of compatibility at the EVM bytecode level. And uh, it's not only specific language, but we can support all the toolings around directly. So if you are like contract developer, the development experience on Scroll will be exactly the same as Ethereum. And uh, in this lecture, it will be divided into four parts. Firstly, I'm going to introduce some background and motivation of why we need the KVM in the first place and why it becomes so popular in recent two years. Then I'm going to guide you through a complete journey of how to build the KVM from scratch, uh, including the circuit organization and the proof system. And after that, I will go through some interesting research problems we met when we are building our ZK EVM. And finally, I will introduce some other applications that can also leverage ZK EVM. So let's start with the traditional diagram of layer one blockchain, um, especially for some ZK nerds who are not even familiar with blockchain. Uh, let me do a quick introduction of blockchain. So a blockchain network is consists of many nodes, usually tens of thousands of nodes for decentralization and they are interconnected by a P2P network. Um, and all the nodes are maintaining the same state um, shown here, which is a database uh, like a shared ledger. So you can like put your balance here or um, some code for a program here. And then you, you use a data structure called Merkle tree to store all those information on your leaf. And then you get a state root, um, which is a, like you, you just do hash and then you get a digest here to represent all your, all your state. And uh, every node need to maintain the same database. And then they will also run the same software called Ethereum Virtual Machine to do some computation and update the state root. And blockchain is also called a word computer because anyone can use that to run any program in a decentralized fashion. And uh, the program running on top of blockchain is called smart contract. Um, so the EVM uh, will, will load this data from your storage do some computation and revise this tree and get a new state root. And uh, if you are a user, you can send the transactions and it will be broadcasted in this P2P network. Um, there will be some consensus algorithm uh, to elect a proposer in each time slot. And this, this proposer will pack many transactions it received into a block and uh, run, run EVM uh, with a transaction as input um, and update this state root and uh, then it will submit this block. And uh, after saying this block is submitted, everyone in the network um, will download this block and re-execute the transactions inside this block to reach some consensus about the state root. Um, so the blocks are chained uh, together like one after the other and uh, the, the nodes need to uh, do a testation or which is re-execute um, the transactions inside this block for all the blocks um, to, to reach the same state root so, so that they are maintaining the same database always. Um, and uh, there are many benefits um, of the blockchain system. Um, it's secure since your transaction will be uh, executed tens of, of thousands of times by different nodes. Um, and it's also decentralized um, because no one can censorship your transaction. If one node is re rejecting your transaction, you can easily send to, to the other but it's super expensive and super slow. And many inefficiency come from 
like all the nodes doing the same computation, tens of thousand nodes, um, and also need to reach some consensus. It's very common uh, for you to pay for over $10 as gas fee on Ethereum, especially when congested, it's even much higher. So that's a problem we want to solve. We want to solve the scalability problem. And uh, so that's, that's what, why uh, we use ZK Rollup. ZK Rollup is a scaling solution to, to solve the scalability problem of Ethereum. Uh, let's take a look at the diagram of ZK Rollup. So the idea is that instead of broadcasting all the transactions on a congested and expensive layer one P2P network, we have a separate layer two network, which can be more centralized uh, with a much higher throughput. And this layer two network will post its state route in layer one smart contract. And then like all the users on layer two um, need to send the transactions to this uh, a bit more centralized node. And the node will process all those transactions and generate a very small and efficiently verifiable ZK proof pi. And uh, this pi is saying that all those n transactions are valid. And after executing all those n transactions, the state route will be uh, updated to state root prime. And then like uh, it was update the, the root prime uh, in, in the smart contract. So the layer one only need to verify this very single proof uh, instead of executing, re-executing all the transactions and then like uh, update the state root. So the magic here relies on zero-knowledge proof to compress a huge batch of transactions into a small and pub but publicly verifiable proof. In this way, layer one can be scaled up massively. Imagine that if a layer one network, uh, because it's so decentralized, it can process only 10 transactions per second. Now every transaction is verifying a proof, which, can, which is basically proving maybe once on the transaction are valid. So the network throughput can increase for order of magnitudes. And also the security is equivalent because you ZK proof, the validity of ZK proof only rely on math and crypto assumptions and it's mathematically equivalent to the validity of all, all those n transactions. Although it sounds like so magic, like you can compress a large um, computation off chain to this proof, but it's non-trivial to build such a zk up system for many reasons. One is that, as we all know, um, if you want to generate proof for some computation, uh, you firstly need to write all your program logic in the form of the circuit, arithmetic circuit. It's very complicated and hard. Uh, and hard. From previous lecture, uh, you, you know that you can only use some addition, multiplication, and similar math assertions in your circuit to express very complicated logic, including for loop, if else, and uh, all your program syntax. It's just very complicated. And also like um, one circuit uh, is corresponding for one program. So which means uh, for, for different uh, application developer, you, you need to implement your own circuits. So that's, that's really a pain point for, pain point for ZK Rollup in, in the past years because uh, you are basically requiring a Solidity developer to write a very complicated circuit to scale up their own application. Um, so, and also like even after this, you need to pass a very rigid secure auditing, uh, which just takes a fairly long development time. And uh, worse still, uh, even if like, for example, you are, you are like Uniswap, a swap application, um, and it, there is a lending application, for example, Aave, they all build their own ZK Rollup, there is still no composability. So, which means you can't uh, use one transaction um, to include like transactions on, on Uniswap and Aave and include that in an atomic transaction. You don't have a composability, but that's the composability is super important uh, in decentralized finance. And uh, because you just can't prove for a dynamic sequence of, of, of transactions, of, of circuits in, in one proof. Since, um, and also you, you might need different on-chain verifier with different weak keys. It just makes the system become more complicated uh, or need some specialized system. So that's exactly the problem we want to solve. We want developer friendly because we don't want solid developer to write the key circuits or even touch any math. And also we want composability because we want the applications deployed on layer two network to have atomic composability and calling each other inside one transaction. So instead of proving for application specific logic, we are proving on the EVM level with a shared like global state similar to layer one. 
So to build a general property zero up, we need to general proof for arbitrary type of EVM transactions. So that's exactly called ZK EVM. In short, ZK EVM can prove a batch of EVM transactions are valid using a ZK proof. And technically speaking, it's a set of, of circuits and using those circuits, you can prove EVM is executing correctly so that you can handle any EVM transaction. So um, previously, uh, when you're thinking of application specific ZK up, you get um, different, different circuits per smart contract or per application. But now different smart contract are part of the input to your ZKVM circuits and you are only proof on the virtual machine level. And, uh, but you know, like it, it sounds like magic, but the problem is that the KVM is extremely hard to build with a super large overhead. So basically instead of developer to face the problem of building a circuit by themselves, we take the hardest part to build a general purpose virtual machine circuit. And it's super complicated. Um, it's very complicated already to implement some functions inside the kit, but you know, even now, even like not only building for, for program, but you are handling the virtual machine logic. You, you need to implement a lot of opcodes. You, you need to handle the workflow. You need to handle the error cases and uh, so on. And uh, just a lot of uh, VM specific logic. And also like, even if you, you, you really write out a, a sound circuit, um, two years ago, people think the pruning overhead for the KVM will be, will be huge. So for example, it might take you like one day to generate a ZKVM proof for N transactions. Uh, but luckily, the efficiency of ZK protocol has been massively improved in the past two years. And so that's the reason why in recent two years, ZKVM becomes like, you know, so popular, it's become really possible. At least four major reasons why it becomes possible. So first is according to polynomial commitment. So on the one hand, you can have a universal setup or transparent setup with different polynomial commitment schemes. But on the other hand, more importantly, uh, it enables flexible uh, optimization like lookup and some high degree custom case. So imagine that previously you don't have polynomial commitment, you only have growth 16. So uh, your, your bilinear pairing requires that you have to use degree two constraints, which um, is less flexible. And uh, so that's why like with polynomial commitment scheme, you can support more flexible optimization and it can make your circuit become one or two order of magnitude smaller. And so that's why it becomes more efficient. On the backend side, the proving algorithm, like when you're generating proof, you need to run some proving algorithm and the proving algorithm is highly parallelizable. So there is hardware acceleration through GPU effort, IPG effort and ASIC effort making prover become another one or two order of magnitude faster. So, um, and uh, finally, uh, there is a recursive proof and uh, it will further lower the cost of on-chain verification. So basically you can like aggregate multiple proof into one proof and make the verification becomes even smaller. So combining with all those four factors, the KVM becomes finally possible with around like three order of magnitude efficiency improvement comparing with what we have two years ago. So that's where uh, scroll began. And uh, there are many different type of, of ZKVM out there. Here, uh, I will use the standard proposed by Justin Drake, which I think is the most intuitive one. Um, and the first one uh, is language level. So the idea is that EVM is not designed for ZK and the writing circuits for EVM will introduce a large overhead because EVM has so many ZK unfriendly opcodes. And so instead of building EVM inside ZK, inside a ZK circuit, you build a totally new virtual machine, which is more friendly for ZK and it enable like more ZK friendly hash function and all those kind of primitives. But then there is a compatibility issue because you you are using a different virtual machine, which is not EVM. One, why you are calling yourself the EVM? Um, because so because for this new virtual machine, you might need new programming languages, and so developers are not really deploying uh, what they can do on Ethereum. So to solve this, uh, you also need to write a compiler to compile uh, EVM language like Solidity and and U to your virtual machine bytecode. So combining this compiler. Um, and this, this, this new ZK virtual machine, you still get some level of compatibility 
with your EVM language. And this approach is adopted by MetaLab and Starkware. So that's why it's, it's called language level zk EVM, because basically you are using a, a compiler to force compile a EVM language, not to EVM, but to another virtual machine, and then prove for this more zk friendly virtual machine efficiently. And uh, the second level is called bytecode level. And it can take your EVM bytecode and prove the bytecode is executing correctly. In this way, all the toolings around EVM can be compatible with the EVM directly. It's not specifically using a compiler to support sp special language, but can support everything that EVM can support. It can inherit the EVM execution model. But you can still make some trade-offs. For example, like you can change the data structure of, of your storage, uh, with, with some zk friendly alternatives, but this stuff doesn't influence on the execution layer. It only influences how you store the data. And, uh, but the trade-off is that uh, you get a longer proving time because many primitives are not zk friendly and you are proving at a lower level of, 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 of compatibility with, with EVM. And last classification is con called consensus level, or sometimes people call that ECM equivalent zk EVM. It basically need to maintain everything that ECM has. It's not only EVM, but also the storage and even some other information in the block header. Um, this, the trade-off is that it has a much, much longer proving time and uh, it might introduce some potential DOS attack because you need to maintain the gas price to be the same and a lot of things like that. So uh, it's still under exploration. And we are in the middle here but we are collaborating with the privacy and scaling exploration team at ECM Foundation to help ECM to scale on the consensus level and doing more exploration there as much as we can. Uh, in this section, uh, I'm going to show you how to build a ZKVM from scratch. Uh, I will talk about how we are choosing among different circuit optimization and proving algorithms. So let's start uh, with the workflow of, of zero knowledge proof. So if you want to generate proof for, for a program, you firstly need to express your, your program or computation using a number of arithmetic constraints. And this requires some arithmetic, and the most commonly used one are R1CS, which is a linear combination, um, and the Planckish arithmetic, which is custom gate, lookup, permutation, or IR, uh, which is used in Stark, uh, containing transition constraint and some boundary, boundary constraint. So I will introduce and compare later. And on the backend side, uh, after you get your constraint system, you will run some proving algorithm to generate the proof. And you have already learned um, so many different proving protocols, uh, but uh, here I only list the most commonly used one uh, in industry, so which is a combination of polynomial IOP uh, with a polynomial commitment scheme. Um, so here, like because we are proving for uh, EVM execution, so the program is EVM itself. And uh, uh, for us, we are using Planckish optimization um, to write our constraints, and uh, we are using Planck IOP plus uh, KZG polynomial commitment scheme in the backend to generate the proof. Uh, I will explain why um, later. So let's start with the most um, familiar R1CS um, optimization. And uh, in R1CS, you basically need to lay out all your variables in a long array. And then you, you define your constraints over those uh, n variables. And the format is shown here. It's a linear combination times linear combination equal to some linear combination. So here are some examples. Uh, you, you can just add any coefficient to those variables and linear combine and the addition is almost free here, but uh, in each constraint, uh, the degree need to be um, at most two. And uh, uh, when you are proving for concrete instance, uh, you need to fill up all those variables with concrete values. Um, and proving that uh, I know a vector, which is input VA, VB, VC, blah, blah, blah. And uh, that is satisfy all those constraints. And eventually, like, you know, if prover can prove that, the verifier know that this computation um, for this circuit uh, is carried out correctly. And uh, differently, um, in, in Planckish organization, uh, you are laid out all the variables, not in an array, but in a two-dimension table. 
So uh, this is a table, um, and uh, you will fill up all those uh, all the table uh, with your with your values like you know input variable v variable v here, and uh, you fill up this table with with all those values. Um, and then like you can define um, different type of constraints. Uh, there are three type of constraints which you can write about. The first is called custom gate. So basically you can define any ship uh, within the table. Um, that's, that's, that's called a gate. That is, so for example, you can define this, this ship as your new gate, and then you can define arbitrary relationship between those, those values or, or like in the cells within those gates. So for example, uh, you can define v3 times vb3 times vc3 uh, minus vb4 equal to zero. Um, and uh, you can define basically arbitrary ship. And uh, uh, the, 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 the comparison with R1CS is that the degree can be higher because you can define arbitrary uh, relationship for your, for your gate. And it's also more customized. For example, you can comprise three uh, multiplications inside one constraints. And uh, for example, you can define this ship um, and define arbitrary uh, relationship in, the, in your custom gate. And you can define even some very irregular shape like this. And uh, the second constraint you can uh, define in Planckish organization is called permutation. So it defines equality among different cells. So it can be link be used to link different gates. Um, like for example, like uh, VB4 equal to V6 equal to equal to this cell equal to this cell. Imagine that uh, in previous slides, if you define some custom gate here, custom gate here, and if you want to link different gates together, um, and then like you can just use one permutation uh, to prove that you know this cell, uh, the, the gate for this, uh, the, the gate here, the output of this gate here is equivalent to the input of this gate here, so that you can link different gates together. And the last constraint you can define is called lookups, so. Basically, what you can prove is that you can define a tuple and prove that this tuple belonging to a table. Like this tuple is like V7, VB7, VC7, it belongs to this table here. Um, so why, why this is super powerful? Uh, let me show you some example here. So imagine that uh, you want to prove for the range of VC7 is within 0 to uh, 15. So Imagine that you want to prove, prove this in R1CS. Uh, what you need to do is that firstly you need to uh, decompose uh, this 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 value into four bits, and firstly prove that uh, each bit is within the range of zero to one using this value times value minus one equal to zero. Uh, so that's already like four constraints, and then you prove that linear combination of those uh, those variables equal to uh, VC seven. So it's very complicated. Um, and use many constraints. But here, uh, what you can do is that you can brute force all the possibilities within that range, like from zero to 15. And then as far as you can prove that VC7 is belonging to this column, then like it's clear that VC7 um, is in this range. So you can do range proof very efficiently. And similarly, uh, you can look up a tuple to prove some bitwise operations are correct. So for example, V7, uh, XOR VB7 equal to VC7. Um, what you can do is that you can brute force all the, this XOR table and, and all the, store all the possible entries here um, as some fixed column. And then you can, you can prove that uh, this tuple belong to this table instead of like uh, proving for this XOR uh, relationship, which is needs a lot, a lot, a lot of constraints in R1CS. And can, it can really reduce your, your circuit size. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's extremely helpful, not only for some fixed uh, brute force table, but also it's extremely helpful for doing some RAM operation, uh, which is read and wrap operation uh, in the context of ZKEVM. Because imagine that if you are building for a virtual machine circuit, uh, in a virtual machine, uh, it usually have memory, which you, you write and some, some data to this memory, right to some, some places, and then later you will read from that, uh, from, from that position. So you basically need to prove that your read and write are consistent. So you can use a table, uh, which is generated on the fly as your RAM table, and you, you, you just put all the entries like in this table, 
And later when you are using this operand, you can look up into this table. So that's why it, it, it's, this lookup table can be extremely helpful for um, some RAM operation. So that's why like uh, we need this lookup so much in, uh, in the KVM. I will give more specific examples later. But uh, as a summary, uh, here are the constraints uh, you can use in Plunkish organization. So there is the custom gate, uh, there is the permutation, and there is lookup tables. And error for Stark is quite similar. Uh, you can think of uh, the optimization in Stark as uh, you, you, you can only define gate to be um, this kind of rectangular um, of your uh, like adjacent two rows. And then like the relationship, the constraints you are writing basically need to transform uh, the first row to the second row. So in each, you can imagine that uh, in each row represents some state in a virtual machine. And then the, the next uh, row is another uh, new state. And your constraints is defining that uh, the transition between the first row to the second row is correct, which actually Plunkish is a more generalized uh, uh, format because you, your gate can be arbitrary, not only like you know two JSON rows, but you can define like any any shape with with different rotations. So I won't go into detail for Stark. Now um, the question is how we how we can like choose the front end for our ZKVM. Um, so here is our computation we need to prove. And uh, so if you look at the computation inside EVM, there are four challenges. One is that uh, EVM word size is 256 bit. So uh, every uh, word, every variable using EVM is 256 bit. And this is uh, extremely problematic for, uh, for Zeki circuit because uh, Zeki circuit usually require uh, the field to be uh, at least some, some prime field or some scalar field of a EPA curve. And usually we are using uh, some, some curve, even if it's some large EPA curve, the, 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 the field is usually 254 bit. And EVM word size is even larger than that. So basically every time you need to use a variable, you need very efficient range proof, almost everywhere to, to limit that you are, uh, you are not using some, some value that out of the range. Um, so that's one problem. And second problem is that EVM has so many Zeki unfriendly opcodes. Um, for example, it has CatCheck, SHA-256. Um, it's just in general, many hash functions uh, are very Zeki unfriendly and you need a very large and complicated Zeki circuit to prove for those opcodes. So sometimes you need to uh, have separate circuits for those hash functions and link different circuits together. And also for some Zeki unfriendly, uh, even, even some bitwise operations, at this scale, it's very ZK unfriendly. So you need to um, handle those ZK unfriendly logic, uh, or and sometimes like even outsource that to other circuits and connect them together. And third, as I mentioned, is that uh, it's a virtual machine circuit where you have this problem for read and write consistency. So you need some kind of efficient mapping to prove that what you are reading uh, is what you previously have written. And finally, uh, EVM has a dynamic execution trace. So uh, for example, like, you know, for, for this transaction, EVM uh, has a different like execution order uh, because this transaction needs, for example, like add, add, push uh, this sequence, but that transaction is, is different. So you, you need to uh, handle those dynamic uh, like input uh, in a dynamic way. So that's why like we, we need some kind of efficient uh, of selectors to open different constraints uh, at different positions. Uh, you, you will see that later. So, considering all those, um, considering all those those three uh, factors uh, like efficient range proof, uh, efficient way to connect circuits, efficient read and write, uh, we want our circularization to enable lookup. Um, and considering the second one, where you are handling a dynamic uh, execution trace, uh, we want some custom gate uh, because we can just abstract those uh, like opcode pattern and make that become some IR for our circuit and efficiently open those IR for different at different positions. Um, so combining with all those factors, uh, we decide to use Planck externalization. Um, okay, now we already figured out that uh, we are using Planck externalization and figure out the reason why we are using that uh, comparing, with, uh, comparing against RNCS. Now let's write some concrete circuits and build a real ZKVM from scratch. So to write the, the concrete circuits, 
uh, let's take a closer look at uh, what's the exact computation we need to prove and what's happening even uh, like behind the EVM. So we start with some initial word state. As I mentioned, like you have a database, you have state root for that, and then you receive one transaction like from this address to that address. And then it's the, the node after receiving the transaction, uh, the node will run this transaction over EVM. And uh, EVM is a stack-based virtual machine. It will load the, the, the bytecode you are, the, 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 the contract bytecode you are uh, running uh, and load that to memory and execute this bytecode opcode by opcode with this transaction uh, at, your, at your input. And then like when you are executing uh, this transaction, uh, you will result in an execution trace uh, look like this. So this execution trace uh, is composed of a sequence of opcodes that has been executed on EVM. So for example, it contains push, push, store, call value, blah, blah, and finally return. And at the same time, because during execution, you need to write to storage. So you need to change the leaf here. And so you will end up with a different state root prime here. So here is a, is a computation under under like under under node when this node receiving a transaction. Um, so now let's take a look uh, uh, how does the EVM kick in during this process. So since the computation uh, you need to prove is EVM, so you will use EVM as your computational spec for defining all your constraints. So for example, uh, because EVM is executing all those opcodes, so you need to have constraints for all the operations happening inside EVM, including each opcode, circuit for each opcode, um, for this, this bytecode unrolling, uh, for storage, read and write, etc. Et so all the operations inside EVM, will, you need to write some constraints inside the EVM to prove that they are valid. And uh, so the public input for the EVM will be your old state um, and, uh, and your new state and all those end transactions. So your statement will become that uh, the statement that uh, after applying all those end transactions, uh, your state root move from, from this one to state root prime. So verify doesn't need to know the concrete execution trees and the concrete, um, like what's happening, like, uh, like during execution, it only need to know that um, this is a transaction input. After executing that, you get this. So uh, that's what the verifier can see. Verifier only need to update to a new state root. But the EVM already takes this, um, all the execution process um, as witness and prove that. So your execution trace is actually your witness for the EVM. So uh, again, like you know, your uh, the spec defines constraints, but you need some kind of uh, witness which satisfies those constraints. So that's your uh, execution trace. Uh, with those information as, as public input and defined those constraints. Um, and uh, so basically what you are proving inside the logic inside EV EVM, the EVM is that uh, uh, prove that I know an execution trace which is uniquely unrolled from this transaction. Uh, so basically I'm, I'm executing by opcode by opcode and uh, it's valid, which means this execution trace is valid means uh, all the opcode computation for each opcode is valid and read and write are also consistent. For example, like uh, if you have push here, it must be, uh, if you have some kind of um, like pop here, it must be some value which you have already pushed already. Um, as I explained earlier, uh, a transaction is valid, uh, is like equivalent to the execution trace is valid and unique. But the, 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 the information here in the execution trace uh, is is not enough as witness. So the first thing you need to do is unroll this execution trace into a larger uh, execution table because the, uh, I, I'm using table here because uh, eventually all those values will be uh, filled up in a in a Plunkish uh, optimization table and define constraints to to constrain those the, the relationship between those those values. And uh, so uh, let's take a closer look at what the, uh, the the concrete witness you need for each step. So um, in each step, there are three, like mainly three types of different uh, type of witness. One is called step context, uh, one is called key switch, and one is called opcode specific 
uh, witness. So what does step context mean? So step context means when you are executing uh, the step, uh, what's your context variable? So for example, it contains uh, the code hash, uh, which indicates uh, what the code you are executing. Um, and there is a guess left, uh, which means after when you're executing the step, uh, what's the remaining guess? And also contains some program counter, uh, stack pointer as a context for um, like VM context for executing this step. And uh, there is a key switch. So key switch uh, contain all the possible possibilities for opcodes and arrow cases for one, one, one step. So you can imagine that um, so if you have like n different type of possibilities for for this step, then you need to have n n like variables in, inside this area, and it, to indicate that uh, like what is the what this step is used for. So for example, uh, if if this this step is is uh, is add, then you need to put this as add to be one and the other variable to be zero, so that uh, other people know that you know. Uh, this is this is for add because um, every time the, as far as this this value to be one other value to be zero then like it indicates that this function uh, this step is used for for this this opcode um, and you can think of that as a efficient selector uh, select uh, the constraints you need to apply to this area and indicates what this area is used for um, and the last thing is opcode specific witness so it contains all the necessary witness uh, that is needed specifically to, to this step. So for example, uh, if you are, again, if you are proving for add, then you definitely need some kind of operand, right? Like A, a plus B equal to C, because A, B, and C are 256. So I, I'm using high low here to represent the highest half and lowest half. So uh, you need to put your operand here and uh, some other information that is needed as actual witness. For example, you might need some kind of carry um, for 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 add, like because uh, it might overflow and uh, need some other variables. So this place is for opcode specific witness. Uh, now uh, let's take a look at the the some specific constraints, and I will take add as an example um, to see like what the constraints we are defining uh, for 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 those different steps. So. For for step context, um, because it's basically proving that uh, the, the the context variable are consistent. Like when you move from step one to step two, step two to step three, uh, you are executing uh, in the same context. So you you basically basically the step context you need to prove for two adjacent steps the variables are consistent. So um, here is your constraints. So you need to write s add times p c prime. Uh, minus pc minus one equal to zero, which means uh, if s add is one, because if s add is zero, which means this step is not for uh, for add. So only if uh, this this s add is is one, which means this error is is one, then like you know this pc prime need to plus one. So which means uh, if this step is 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 add, then your program counter need to plus one, and stack pointer similarly uh, if it's add then stack pointer need to plus one and the guess need to, to plus three. So uh, this is like the logic for step context. So basically after executing add, uh, what's your context variable will look like. Um, and for key switch, um, as I mentioned, like key switch basically indicates that uh, this area, uh, what is this step used for? So the idea here is that each value need to be binary. It's either to be zero or one, means on or off. So, and uh, at most, there will be only one variables, um, which is, is one, and other variables will all be zero. So you need to write all those constraints like this. Basically, it's s add times one plus one minus s add equal to zero, which means s add is binary. S more is also my binary. All those you you write this for all the all this the values in this area. And then adding them together, you get one, which means, okay, so previously you said, okay, it's, it's all binary. And finally you said uh, there will be only one value and uh, exactly one value, um, the, the, the value of that variable is one. So uh, this is how you constrain this key switch um, to, to guarantee that there will be only one variable 
set to be one. And for your opcode specific witness, um, I'm also using add as an example here. So as add, you need to time as add because it only works if uh, you are selected to be, you, you, this area is select to be add. And so this, if it's add, then like um, a, a plus b minus c equal to zero uh, if there are some carry and uh, there are some carry. So this is add specific logic. So here is a so here is a more complete example for for add, um, but uh, you will notice that there is still one one missing piece. So what's missing here is that um, so for, for if you are doing add, then you are basically uh, popping two elements from your stack, which is a and b, and then you push your c value back. So here you didn't prove that a and b value uh, are what you previously have pushed to the stack. So you basically need to prove that uh, this A and B are consistent with what you push previously, right? So basically it's proving for read and write are consistent. And to achieve this, uh, we use a separate lookup table. So imagine that there is a magic table here um, and uh, assuming that this table has correctly ordered um, all the entries, all the, all the values you need to read and write um, in EVM circuits. And then like you just have a magic table here. And uh, we need to. We only need to inside EVM circuit. We only need to write uh, a lookup constraint, which you look up this value to this table. And as far as it exists in this table, then like it's it, it's correct. So uh, now the problem moves to the table. Like uh, the question becomes, how you are going to prove that uh, this table has a correct order? And uh, because you know, like EVM is pretty EVM circuit is pretty hand waving. It's just lookup. Um, and if it exists, then like it's consistent. But how you are actually cons constraining this table? So what you do is that uh, we will have a separate RAM circuit uh, with different uh, constraints to constrain that this table is generated correctly with the correct order. For example, this RAM circuit will will, will check that uh, like two adjacent rows have like for example the in the, the, the time step uh, is increasing, and uh, the the address will be uh, like has some, some order for this address um, and whether it's read or write. And if, if, if it's, uh, for example, if it's read after write, uh, write after read, then it's need to prove that the value are consistent. So this RAM circuit uh, will be used to prove that all the tables, all the entries in the, inside this RAM table are correct. So this is, uh, I won't go into the detail here, uh, but if you are interested, we have more specific uh, explanations on our YouTube channel, you can check out. Um, so this is, but this is basically how you handle stack, memory, and storage. So basically you have separate circuits to handle those circuits. And then inside EVM circuits, you are just hand waving and look up into that, into that table. And uh, similarly, when you need to prove some really zicky unfriendly opcode, like hash function, uh, you, you just simply can't put all the witness within that tiny opcode specific area, right? And because hash is so complicated, it, it, it needs many rows, more than just like uh, two or three rows. So what, what you need to do is that, for example, you want to prove that uh, this is input, this is your, uh, the, 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 the hash result of your, your, your input, and then like you just put your value here and directly assume that uh, it's correct. And then inside EVM circuits, what you do is that uh, you look up this tuple like input comma hash input and uh, to a to a table and then as far as it, this this pair exists in that table then it means this input and this hash output has the relationship you want and uh, then like the magic become like how you kind of uh, generate this hash lookup table so previously when we are we are proving for range proof uh, the, the lookup table is quite simple because it's fixed um, even for some bitwise operation, it's fixed table. But now, because you can't brute force all the input for hash function, and it has to be, this, this lookup table has to be constructed in a way uh, that is dynamic. So only proving for the pairs that you want them to, to prove. So again, like you, you just imagine that there exists such a uh, magic lookup table, um, which store all the possible entries like input and hash, hash input pair and uh, like, man, man, like just store many entries like that. And all the EVM circuits were, when they need hash, they just look into this table as far as it exists, then it's cracked. 
then like again, uh, how do you guarantee that the entries uh, in this table are correct? So what you do is that uh, similarly, you have a hash circuit, uh, which you, you write, you encode all the hash constraints inside the circuits. And then using this constraints, you can prove that all the entries are cracked together. So you basically take all the input and the hash output, all the mod many instances, and then use one circuit to prove that uh, like they are cracked. So it's, you just separate that into a specific circuit. Um, okay, now let's take a look at the overall architecture uh, of the ZKVM circuits. So you firstly start with some EVM circuit on the top to constrain the whole state machine. It's divided into multiple steps um, and you have an execution trace, which is your witness. You unroll this execution trace um, to specific variables and fill up in the EVM circuits and EVM circuit defining some uh, like your constraints, uh, like constraining each step or look up into some other circuits. And then uh, like every time you, you met with some really hard opcodes, you just imagine that there is a magic table. So for example, there is a fixed table uh, for like bitwise op operations, range check. And uh, for example, there is a catch check table, which stores the, all the input and the output um, pair, which is used in EVM. And uh, there is a RAM table for all the read and write entries. There is a bytecode table, there is a transaction table, there is a block context table. And you just imagine that all those tables exist. And every time EVM circuit has some problem, you just look up into this, this table and imagine that this table um, is, is correct. And then for each table, you need to use separate circuits uh, to prove that all the entries in this table are valid. So for fixed table, because it's fixed, it's pre-processed, you don't need to constrain that. But for catch check table, for example, you need to have a catch check circuit proving that catch check, catch -check is a hash function. Um, for th that all the entries in catch -check table are correct. And uh, for, for RAM table, because it contains some storage, memory, and stack operations. So for storage operation, you need a Merkle potential tree circuit uh, to constrain that storage is correct. And in this MPT, um, if you are using the Merkle potential trio, like Ethereum, then you need to look up uh, into catch -check table because uh, constructing a Merkle tree needs hash and you need to look up into that table. And RAM circuit for stack and uh, uh, and, 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 and memory operations. And there is a bytecode circuit proving for bytecode unrolling. And there is a transaction circuit, block circuit. And for a signature even, you can have an ECDS circuit uh, to constrain the, the signatures in that table. And a transaction circuit can just look up this table. So basically you can imagine that uh, the given circuit is a set of circuits. Um, they are connected by lookup tables. Okay, so uh, just a quick, quick recap of where we are so far. Um, we, we compared the RNCS with Plunkish authorization and uh, explained the reason why Plunkish is a better fit for virtual machine circuit, mainly due to the support of custom gate uh, and lookup tables. And then we explained how to write the constraints uh, for our ZKVM and uh, explained the architecture for the ZKVM, which is like a EVM circuit on top and uh, and many separate circuits for different functionalities and they are interconnected by this lookup tables. And now after the front end, um, let's move to the back end and see uh, how you are actually generating proofs and how we are choosing different proof systems. So again, here is the, all the circuits we need for the key EVM. So there is the EVM circuit for say transition, RAM circuit, um, and a bunch of others like ECDSC circuit and all those other circuits. So in theory, you need to generate proof for each circuit and verify all the proofs to know that you are executing a transaction correctly because you need all the functions, all the components uh, to function um, like as expected to know that one transaction is correct. But in practice, it's too expensive to verify all those proofs. So instead, we have an aggregation circuit to prove that all those proofs from those sub circuits are valid. And in the end, you will only have one aggregation proof um, instead of like many different proofs, which can massively reduce the verification overhead. Um, and uh, so accordingly, when you are considering the proof system, 
uh, we can use a two-layer architecture. So basically, the first layer, uh, you need to generate proof for, for EVM for, for those kind of direct, you are directly proving for EVM logic. So, um, and second layer is mainly targeting at the proofs from the first layer. So, but, but here, like you can use a different uh, proof system. So let's take a look at the uh, requirement for different layers and figure out what's the best proof system for each, because you can, be, you can basically compose different proof systems together um, because they have different requirements and different targets. So let's take a look at the first layer. So the first layer need to handle some really large computation, which is directly coming from your EVM. And uh, so you basically, because you are directly proving for EVM logic, uh, you need some very good support for custom gate and lookups. You need to be really expressive because you are handling different type of, of, of computation inside EVM and uh, more customized. So the proof system, Ideally, we want them to support custom gate and lookup. And second requirement is that you want some really hardware friendly prover to make prover faster. By saying hardware friendly, I mean two things. One is highly parallelable. So your prover, uh, if you are using GPU, which can like you basically make your proof like 10 times or even 100 faster because it's so parallelized um, and also low peak memory. So basically, for example, you can, you, you, you can process your, your circuits like circuit by circuit, or like you can have some way uh, to reduce the maximum usage of your, your memory. For example, like, you know, uh, in, in some cases, if you, you require very large FFT, then your memory requirement will become high. But if you are doing some multi exponentiation, you can do that like chunk by chunk and to reduce your peak memory. So we want some hardware friendly prover because we want some efficiency. And third requirement is that the verification circuit should be small because Eventually, uh, the aggregation circuit is proving for the verification algorithm from your previous proof system. So the verification circuit need to be small. And uh, the, the, the last requirement is that ideally, we want uh, the, the proof system to have transparent setup or uh, universal trusted setup because uh, EVM is, is upgrading. And if you are using application specific uh, trusted setup, then like you will have some trouble because basically every time you do some upgrade, you need to run your setup. So in the first layer, it's very important that you have you at least have some universal trusted setup so that you don't need to run this uh, ceremony again and again. And here are some promising candidates. So uh, from, from Polygon, there is Plunky2, there is Starkey, there is eStark, uh, which basically all using uh, like a, also a Plunk-like IOP but use Fry as a polynomial committance scheme. And it has some really nice properties, for example, like Plunky2 and, uh, and those proof system use a smaller field called Goldilocks, which can make the computation on, on CPU become really fast. Because it's not a big curve, you can use a smaller field, which can fit into a smaller, so Goldilocks is like 64 bit, which can fit into a CPU register. So you can do computation much faster. And also you can support custom gate lookup um, and it's hardware friendly because it's, it's, it's fast and verification circuit is smaller um, and uh, it, it has a transparent setup. And uh, another promising category is Halo 2 or Halo 2 KDG version. So Halo 2 is initially developed by the cache team. And uh, initially Halo 2 is, uh, uh, they, they, they use the Plunky authentication on the front end with the flexibility, with very flexible support for custom gate and lookups. But Halo 2 initially use a inner product argument uh, with a pass tucker, which uh, you, you, can, you can do folding, you can do, um, like, because it's a cyclically curve, you can do recursion uh, very efficiently. However, uh, pass tucker is, like, pass tucker curve is not directly supported on, on Ethereum layer one. And also, like, because you are using inner product argument, uh, so if you are very familiar, you know that it will have some kind of log logarithmic verification. So which means, um, so in the first place, EVM doesn't support past our curve. So you can't use pre-compile, so verification will be very expensive. And second, because this log logarithmic uh, verification, it can make the, the, it even more expensive than um, on like ECM. So that's the reason why there is a derivative which we are using, and also like the PSD team from Ethereum Foundation, they're using, um, is called Halo 2 KDG version. So we basically replace 
the polynomial commitment part in Halo 2 with KDG. Because for KDG, um, we, we, we can have very small, small proof. And uh, also because KDG, uh, we are using BN curve, uh, it's supported on ECM, so it can be efficiently verified on ECM. And there are some other new um, like candidates which are very promising. Like for example, there are some linear time prover which remove FFT to be more hardware friendly. Um, and there are a bunch of like new IOPs around that. Um, and also another recent trend is like using, because Nova is famous for fast, um, small threshold uh, aggregation and recursion. So if you can use Nova to uh, recursively prove for maybe a repeated cat check or whatever, then you, you might be able to get some uh, very efficient um, like prover with those. But, but currently, uh, like all those some check based protocol or Nova, like initially in the paper, they only support R1CS. So if they can support Planckish optimization, which there are already recent work from geometry, um, like talking about that, how to how you can support um, like degree two custom gate uh, in Nova. And there are some new new work uh, supporting lookup folding in Nova. Um, and also there is new new work called Supernova, which can support, um, like you can fold different circuits. So those are, all very interesting line of work, which can be promising uh, in the first layer to make your prover efficient um, and also universal. Uh, verification is smaller and support um, some optimization. And now let's take a look at the second layer. So the second layer, because uh, you, you, you generate a aggregated proof. So the second layer need to be very verifier efficient, especially uh, efficiently verified on EVM because eventually you need to submit this proof on, on Ethereum. So, there are some requirements. First requirement, like as mentioned, like proof is efficiently verifiable on EVM. You have smaller proof, uh, you, you have low, low, low gas cost um, for verifying the proof. And second is that uh, you, you need to consider the best practice from previous one because you need to prove for uh, verification circuit of the former layer and you, you, you need to prove that efficiently. And uh, also ideally, it should be also be hardware friendly for efficiency and ideally transparent or universal stress setup. But transparent or universal setup is not a very harsh requirement for aggregation circuit, uh, especially if you have some very good design. The reason is that because aggregation circuit is only proving that proofs are valid and uh, the proof verification logic is usually fixed. So even if you have some kind of growth 16, even growth 16 or um, some more like application specific trust test tab uh, because you are only proving for proofs. Um, so you, you can change your logic here, but without changing the logic here. So that's why I only write ideally uh, you want this property. So some promising candidates which, which can make your, your proof become really small is like growth 16, which is still remaining a very uh, like efficient prover in the literature. And another candidate might be Planck with very few columns. So imagine that um, when I mentioned like, like Planckish optimization, you can, you can think of a, a, a table and uh, the, this table has many columns and uh, the verification cost uh, is linear to the column number. So if you can, and, the, and also this table is configurable, you can configure this table to be really, really thin and really tall. And then like you have very fewer columns, so you can reduce your verification cost to be very, very small. And then like with either KDG, polynomial commitment scheme, like so, so that's one row will have one, one like, you know, opening proof or a flunk, which sacrifice prover time with verification efficiency and which is actually adopted by Polygon Hermes um, like to, to reduce the verification cost. Or there might be Kachak Fry. Um, so basically you are using Fry, um, but you are using Kachak because EVM has Kachak uh, pre-compile and it can be uh, verify efficiently. But mostly if people don't care about this um, trusted setup thing, uh, they will go with KDG or, or Flunk or, or Growth 16. So um, as far as what we choose, we, we, we choose uh, we, we, our first layer is using Halo to KDG and our second layer is also Halo to KDG. Um, but the, the only difference is that uh, it, like recall previous lectures uh, when you so from interactive proof to non-interactive proof, you need some fair shamir to hash the previous transcript uh, to a randomness. So because in aggregation circuit, uh, you need to prove the verification algorithm 
and uh, so you want the hash out the hash used in this verification algorithm is efficiently provable. So that's why like we, 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 we are using Poseidon hash for Fia Shamir in previous layer and then using catch hack in the second layer because eventually you need to verify this application proof on layer one. Because the first layer, because Halo 2 can support custom gate and lookup. And also it has very good prover performance because we have very fast GPU prover and we have paper talking about that. You can check out, check out that on, on S plus. Um, and uh, the verification circuit is also very small because uh, it's KDG. So you only per, 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 per column, you only have a very small, small proof. And also it's a universal setup. And secondly, why we are choosing KDG, Halo 2 KDG is that um, because we have custom gate and lookup support, so we can prove the non-native operations of KDG opening still very efficiently. Um, and then we, again, like we, we can reuse our GPU prover. And uh, also we can configure this because it's Halo 2 and it can support Plunky standardization, we can configure this table to be really, really thin and that verification is very, very small. So it can be configured to be very small. So that's why we are, we are like using this. And this is one of the major differences um, which differentiate us from, from Polygon Hermes. So they are basically using the first layer, uh, they are using a, a Stark and then like they use even multiple layer of Stark to shrink the proof size and then finally, they use a uh, they use a flunk to uh, make on-chain verification even even smaller. But here we are we are using directly using um, Halo Two KDG Halo Two KDG, which is basically a Plunk LP plus KDG. And uh, um, also we are we are considering like also having multiple layer of aggregation to even aggregate uh, many aggregated proofs. So. Let's take a look at the, the, this, the concrete layout. Here I only list some, some, some status for, for EVM circuits. Um, so EVM circuits has like over 100 columns, over 2000 custom gates and 50 lookups. And the highest custom gate degree is nine. And for around 1 million gas, it needs around two powers 18 rows. And the more gas uh, you want to prove, the more rows you will need like for example if you you need like two, two million gas it's just double the, the number of rows and then in the second layer um you, you need to aggregate proofs like from even circuit ram circuit all those circuits uh, into one proof so um and, and but 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 this aggregation circuit the proof need to be submitted on layer one so it's very thin so it only has like 23 columns one custom gate and seven lookup tables and the highest custom gate degree is five and uh, for for aggregating like many circuits, it takes like two powers twenty five rows. And uh, uh, j just to, to to like uh, to notice here is that this is not uh, finalized. So currently we are actually using two layer of aggregation. Um, so one one layer aggregation is like twenty three columns. But right after this aggregation layer, we have another layer which uh, might only use like three columns or or, or four or five columns to even reduce the verification cost further to and uh, and also like uh, the serial number will be massively reduced with some optimizations from from axiom and uh, it's still working in progress but we believe that this can be uh, further reduced and also like uh, if you are increasing the the gas limit uh, the aggregation circuit uh, won't be uh, the, the aggregation circuit size won't be increased because uh, you only increase the real number, but the proof verification won't be changed. It only ins influences the proving time in the first layer. So, um, and besides that, we have done crazy optimizations um, for our prover, mainly on GPU. So uh, we have optimized the uh, most computational heavy part uh, inside prover on GPU, including uh, MSM, which is uh, uh, like inner product over its curve and NTT, which is uh, uh, like FFT over finite field, and also quotient kernel, which is computing the quotient polynomial. So if, if you are interested in this, again, like we, we have um, some videos talking about uh, more specifically into this GPU optimization, poor optimization, you can check out some other videos. Um, and also like that's one optimization for, for different computational kernel. And also we pipelined um, and overlap CPU and GPU comp computations, like when you're 
doing things on G CPU. You can also compute something on GPU at the, at the same time to overlap to further reduce your latency. And also we have multi-card implementation. We have done a bunch of crazy memory optimizations to reduce from like one gigabyte memory, which is our starting point to around like 300 gigabytes memory. And the performance is also great. Like for EVM circuits, uh, eventually the GPU prover takes around 30 seconds. And for aggregation circuit, um, it takes around like two minutes. Um, it, it's actually uh, even more reduced like with our recent uh, optimization, including power level sensor side and some other optimizations. Um, but this can show that, you know, the EVM is already practical. So for around 1 million gas, the first layer will take two minutes. The second layer takes around three minutes. And uh, for example, if you want to increase to 10 million gas, then the first layer will just be like 20 minutes and second layer still be, be three minutes. So uh, it's not finalized. Again, like we, we expect that to be within 10 minutes uh, in the future for, for one block. But uh, like, you know, we just done many, many optimizations for, for that. In this section, I'm going to talk about some interesting research problems we met when we are building our ZK VM. Uh, still, like I will talk from the front-end circuit to the back-end prover. Now, let's take a look at some, some of the interesting problems in the on the circuit side. So again, let's start with our EVM layout. So th this is our EVM circuit layout, and you have spec compacts, case switch, and opcode specific witness. And as I said, EVM word size is 256 bit. And uh, it's problematic because for the variables inside your circuit, you need to be limit that into a smaller finite field. So you can't fit into 256 bit word into such a, such a cell. So what we do here is that um, we decompose 256 bit into 32 limbs and each limb is 8 bit so that we can do efficient range proof for each limb like you can look up this 8 bit limb into a 2 powers 8 size table so that you, you, you know that it's late 8, 8 bit size so that you can do efficient range proof for 256 bit word and also fit this 8 bit limb into smaller cell so this is your value. You decompose that into eight bin leaps. Uh, but it's problematic because every time when you need this EVM word, you will need to bring and duplicate 32 variables. So what we do here is that we encode a EVM word using something called random linear combination or RLC. So this linear, random linear combination is basically taking all those 32 numbers and then use the randomness to combine those numbers into one encoded value. And then every time you need to use this 256 bit word, you just use this encoded value instead and the proof for this constraint. So it's very convenient and efficient. But here are some problem. So because you are using a random number to linear combine 32 values. So those 32 values should be fixed and then theta should be derived from those numbers or, or, or fixed, fixed values. Because for example, if, if theta and A1 to A31 are decided at the same time, then you can adjust your, your, your limb number to change your encoded value. So it only makes sense if A0 to A31 is already fixed and then you use a new randomness to linear combine those values. But if you take a look at the witness, um, this is your encode value, this is your limp, it's, it's all part of the witness. So which means prover need to fill up um, both parts by, them, by themselves at the same time. So that's a problem. Like you, you basically can't do that uh, if, if RLC and uh, A2 to A31 are generated at the same time. So that's why we implement a feature called multi-phase prover, uh, which is basically saying that you should synthesize a part of the witness, derive this randomness, and then keep synthesizing the rest of the witness so that you can like, you know, derive randomness from previous values to, to, to this value. Um, so this, this is, at first when we find this, this is 
uh, with the PSE team at Ethereum Foundation. This is extremely helpful and it's standardized. Uh, the implementation is called Challenge API and you can find out in, in, in the implementation. It's extremely powerful and um, it can be used in many places. For example, um, as I mentioned, like compress EVM word into one value. And also it can encode dynamic length input. So imagine that if you have cat check or you have any hash function, because you don't know like what's the input size for this hash function. So you can lay out all those input trunks uh, in, in some columns and then encode those values into one value. And then use this as your, your input encoding and uh, which can efficiently represent a dynamic length of input. Um, and uh, third is that you can do some lookup layout optimization. So this is extremely, extremely helpful uh, in our DKM context. So I can briefly explain uh, what is this lookup uh, layout optimization. So as I mentioned, you can look up a tuple to, um, a, a, to a table columns, right? Like for example, imagine that we have a three value tuple. And for example, you, you, and this, 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 the, the values in this tuple can come from any place in this table. So um, imagine that uh, you have one three column table. And uh, if, so the first tuple is looking up this position, this position, this position to this table. And the next uh, tuple is from this position, this position, and this position also into this table. So different positions will introduce different tuples, which means you will, every, every time you do a lookup, you will introduce one additional lookup arguments, which is very costly because almost like one lookup uh, is equivalent to like one custom gate, uh, three custom gate, plus some, some, some columns. So uh, that's very costly. And uh, so one optimization you can do with this randomness is that you can allocate a new empty, empty column. And then you can use this randomness to linear combine those three value tuple into one, one value and put that into this, uh, in, into one cell in this column. And then like if you have like three, three values here, you also use this randomness to linear combine those three values uh, into here. And then you get a, a table, you, you get a table column, which is full of your uh, random linear combined uh, tuples. And then like you can also do the same linear combination for your table column and into one column. And then you only need to look up from this column to that column. So basically imagine that initially you have n lookup tables and look up arguments because you have n tuples looking up into the same same lookup table. And then after this optimization, you optimize that into n custom gates, which is a random linear combined tuples into a cell. And then one lookup because you, you, you look up this column into your lookup table. So you can efficiently um, make those like different positions like and then like lay out that regularly in one table column and then look up that in a table. So this is extremely powerful. But uh, this this randomness also has some some problems um, because as I mentioned, like you know, you need multi-phase prover to derive this randomness, and uh, it's especially problematic when you have many circuits. For example, there is EVM circuit, there is a cache circuit, there is an ECDS circuit. If one circuit need to stop to generate a witness and then other circuits also need to stop if they need this randomness. Because uh, if, for example, like, you know, if you need to look up this value into a uh, catch -up circuit, and then like you, you, you firstly, after synthesizing your EVM circuit, you get your randomness, you get this encoded value, and then bad guy can just put some kind of bad values which will satisfy this requirement because this randomness like he already knows there is a randomness. So he can change this lim number and get some other uh, like encoded version, which is not exactly encoding the same number. And then like uh, do something bad there. So if you have many circuits, this randomness will enforce you to half synthesize all the circuits. So you, you halfly synthesize EVM circuit, you halfly synthesize ECDSC circuit, you halfly synthesize uh, the, the catch -up circuit, blah, blah, blah. And then, deriving the randomness at the same time and then synthesizing the, this circuit, synthesizing that circuit, synthesizing that, that circuit. So you need some kind of asynchronous but problematic 
like way to generate your witness, which will introduce a very large uh, overhead inside prover. So that's the reason why um, in, in reality, we actually put all those ECDS circuit, Kachak circuit, EVM circuits into a super circuit so that we can just have uh, like fewer stages, fewer phases, and then like generate witness for the first half, second half uh, together. So that's the reason why we, we are seriously considering whether we can remove this randomness. And there are some ways, like for example, for email word size optimization, you can divide that into high low, uh, which is like just cut that into two half and uh, only decompose when you need to do range proofs, but carry those two values all the time. We can still save some some number, and uh, for this dynamic length input, you can uh, just divide that into a fixed chunk and do that dynamic times. But for lookup layout optimizations, uh, that's still very important. Uh, we haven't figured out what's the best way to to do this without uh, RLC optimization. Um, and another way to solve this lookup optimization is that if your circuit is layout very regularly, so because for example, like. For every tuple that you need to look up into that table, you lay out that into the same position at the same step. Then you can directly use one lookup to 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 optimize that without kind of recombining into a new new column. But currently, to maximum the usage of each cell, we kind of allocate very freely. So that's why we need this optimization. So this is still remaining an open problem, um, which is very interesting. Uh, and another interesting problem is about the circuit layout comparison. So as I mentioned earlier, the reason why we are using Plunkey serialization is that um, we can handle dynamic execution trace. So what does this mean? It means um, for one transaction, the execution trace can be push, push, add. But maybe for the other transaction, it can be add, pop, uh, push, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so in each step, you need to prove for different opcodes. And uh, so this says, this makes your whole circuit become dynamic. So like recall that in RNCS, if you want to write some constraints, you basically need to fix logic here, fix logic here, and have one fixed circuit. And then like have some pre-processed um, like PK and VK for your like three matrix in, in RNCS. But now like, because step one, you need to constrain for different uh, for different uh, opcodes, and uh, you, you basically need to enable different constraints in different positions. And uh, so Plunkish is much more efficient uh, in doing this because in RNCS, the only way you can do this is that um, in each step, you implement something like a if else logic. Uh, you implement if it's push, then you uh, this is a constraint. If it's, it's, it's pop, then this is a constraint. In each step, you basically need to write out all the possibilities that can happen in this step, which is a VM logic, VM possibilities, and then repeat that for every step. So which is a very gigantic overhead. But using Plunkish optimization, you can define some custom gate for each opcode, like push, you can define an opcode, um, you, you can define a custom gate, for add, you can define some, some, some custom gate, and only open or uh, on or off those constraints at different steps. So like recall that previously there is a key switch. So basically if you set um, that to be one, then like add constraint will be applied to this area. Uh, but if you set that to be, uh, if you set maybe multiplication to be one, then multiplication constraints will be applied to this area, which is super convenient. Which means, you know, using this way, uh, it's very hard to standardize gates. You have to design custom gates for different opcodes. But we are kind of, of building the functionality of custom gates. So for example, like we have over 2000 custom gates um, because in each, each opcode, you might introduce more custom gates and in each opcode, you might introduce some, uh, some, some, some custom gates. So we are thinking of whether there are some better way to, to lay out the whole, the whole custom gate. So one solution can be, um, again, like, you know, it's, it's has some relationship with the previously mentioned this regular layout. So if you can make, you know, uh, maybe your operand to be within this area, and then like you can reuse maybe some kind of range checks across different steps, or you can reuse some basic math gadget across different steps um, to, to reduce some custom gate numbers. Um, or another way like which you can do is that uh, you, you can define some basic, like maybe 20, uh, like micro opcode, 
and then like each opcode is consists of of several macro opcodes, and then like uh, those macro opcodes you will have some constraints for those macro opcodes, and then like you can have uh, the the custom gate number is like how many op macro opcodes you will have, and then like each opcode will be mapped into macro, some macro opcodes, and in this way you can also reduce the uh, custom gate number, but this will also like um make your cell becomes like uh the the the, the usage percentage of of your your circuit will be become like uh, smaller become uh, be, become smaller because previously we allocate cell by cell every cell uh, will be used directly for some function but if you implement you want to reuse then you need to lay out in a way that can be reused which means there will be more empty cells so it doesn't mean like the uh, layout differently and regularly will be more efficient than our current design, but there are some open problems to be explored. Um, and another problem also in the circuit side uh, is what I call a, a dynamic ZKEVM problem. So um, imagine that uh, in step one, you, you are handling some really complicated opcodes like pre-compile. So what you do is that you just outsource that uh, to another pre-compile circuit. And in step two, you also outsource, outsource that in a, to a hash circuit um, if you are handling hash. Um, so there are two problems. One is that because hash, pre-compile, and all those sub-circuits um, are handling different circuits, so they have different lengths of, of, of row number, and they are, like, for example, hash circuit maybe, like, needs many rows because it's very complicated, but maybe some smaller group compile needs fewer, fewer rows. And then there are some problems because uh, eventually, when you are when you are proving, you need to limit uh, what's the maximum size of your circuit. So, for example, we limit the the no, row number to be two powers eighteen, and then like hash circuit might be easier to exceed this this limit um, if if you are not designed properly. Um, and uh, and also like currently in our design to connect different circuits more efficiently, we pad them into the same length. Uh, which will introduce some problem because we are paying for some additional costs even if we are not using that many hash. And also this again like shows you know you will have the same row number, which means you will have some kind of maximum limit of hash you can use inside your circuit. Especially if, for example, if 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 the maximum row number is two powers eighteen, and hash circuit takes two powers like sixteen rows, then you can only use like, you know four hashes in, in one circuit. So which is indeed some indeed very problematic. So we are thinking of whether there are some way which allow you to dynamically prove dynamic number of, of hashes which can exist this number and also like how to link different circuits together. So the, the kind of reason why we, we need to pair them together is that also because of the randomness because if you, 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 you have independent circuits, you need to derive randomness like partial synthesis and derive randomness together. But if you pair them together and put that in the same circuit, it makes your circuit synthesis become faster and uh, more convenient. So you have to solve the previous problem and then like, you know, make this architecture become dynamic and then think of a way to link uh, like dynamic size circuits together. So um, here I list, I summarize all the bad influences, which is, uh, yeah, you, you might need a, a, a maximum of a number of catch hacks um, and uh, because because catch hack might be like need many rows and you have a maximum number of rows limit so which means you have limited number of catch hacks uh, which can be proven in one circuit and also uh, like th this can happen even not only for catch hack but also for some opcode like if some opcode like this step three for example is needs more rows than step two then which means uh, you can fit in less step three opcodes in your circuit than step two, which might be some problem. And you are also, because you pad to the same length, even if you are not using that, you are paying for the proving cost. Um, so can we make the QM become more dynamic and like pay for what we really need and support a larger uh, limit of, of catch hack and all those circuits? So one solution like people are coming up with is that uh, maybe you can use recursive uh, to uh, recursively prove many catch hacks and then like you know then you you can link those 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 input pair input output pairs to the specialized catch hack um, and then in this way like 
you you can have dynamic length of of, of sub circuits and but still connect it to your main circuit. Um, next, I will go through some problems on the back end, which is quite interesting, um, especially uh, for the audience of, of this class because you learn so much about the theoretical um, proof system construction. So um, again, like recall that we have two layer of, of, of circuit and we have two layer of, of, of prover. Um, and uh, in both layer, the, the proving bottleneck is the same because we are reusing the same Halo 2 and KZG. And the most computational heavy part is multi-exponentiation and FFT. So multi-exponentiation, as I explained, is inner product um, on into the curve. And uh, NTT is like FFT over finite field. And you can use GPU to massively parallelize those two components to make the core components become really, really fast. But then the problem moved to witness generation and data copy. So what does this mean? So witness generation is when you are generating the value for the whole table. So that that is not like highly parallelizable and that like differs per circuit or per application. Um, so that's the, the CPU part becomes bottleneck. And for the data copy part, what I'm, I mean here is that, um, for example, for FFT, um, for example, if you are doing a, like two powers, 26 size FFT, so GPU can compute FFT really, really fast. It can uh, like finish computing, for example, in, in, in 20 milliseconds, but copying this data from CPU to GPU takes like much longer time than 20 milliseconds. So the data copy actually become even a larger bottleneck than computation itself. So we need some way which we can reduce this problem. So that's, that's one, 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 one interesting uh, thing we noticed when, during uh, our benchmark. And secondly, that uh, we need a very large CPU memory. So initially when we implement our first leaky EVM, we need almost like one terabyte CPU memory. And then we currently we already optimize that to uh, 300 gigabytes uh, memory on CPU and also optimize this uh, GPU memory becomes like eight gigabytes, which means you can run, uh, run, uh, run our prover on very cheap GPU, but still require a very expensive CPU. So um, the recent problem is that whether you can have some hardware-friendly prover, which by saying hardware-friendly, I mean both parallelizable and uh, with a lower peak memory. And also you shouldn't ignore the witness generation. So because previously, multi-exponentiation and FFT takes 95% of your proving time. Um, so, but, so that's why like, you know, people are all focusing on this this two, two components acceleration. But the problem is that even if you make this part becomes like 10 times faster, then like you, you basically like, you know, in your computation, like 95, you make the 95% of your computation become 10 times faster, then you will bottleneck by still by that smaller 5%, which is a long tail problem, but it can't be ignored. Especially with ASIC, like you, you can make that even faster, but you will still be bottleneck by this within generation. So you shouldn't ignore this within generation. And uh, thir third is like how to run on cheap machines and become more decentralized. So eventually, I think this will evolve uh, into a problem which needs software and hardware called design. Um, because basically, like when you are designing hardware, you also need to consider like you know what's the best software. Uh, like maybe you can, like even the one prover is, is linear time, it can be theoretically be very fast, but it's very super hardware unfriendly. Maybe it's not as practical as like, maybe some some more, like the, the, the theoretical complexity is higher, but it's highly parallelizable in practice and GPU can make that 100 times faster. So it can still beat that linear time prover construction. So we really need to take both into consideration. Um, and uh, finally around like prover, um, there is some problem around like recursive proof and how you can efficiently uh, compose different proof systems. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, so there are, there are like uh, different different like proof systems um, requirement for, for different layers. So the first layer need to be very expressive uh, for handling those EVM logic. And the second layer need to be uh, very, very efficient in EVM. So how to combine, get a better combination? Uh, maybe there are some better combinations than what we have so far. So there are two large directions. One is like people are kind of prefer smaller and smaller field. For example, the Scodilox field, 
uh, which is like 64 bit, and even Mason Prime, which is like, you know, some Mason Prime is like 32 bit, which is a fast computation on CPU and on uh, hardware uh, like IPG and ASIC. So should we move to that smaller field for faster speed and smaller memory? Or another way is like we stick to this elliptic curve based construction, but there are some nice constructions recently like Supernova, Nova, which provide you a, like uh, you can recursively prove dynamic number of, of, of circuits um, with a smaller recursive threshold, or you can use some security curve um, to to also like you know fold your, uh, your 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 proofs and get a very small small proof in the end. And the the good thing about this elliptic curve based construction is that um, because your core computation core computation is bottlenecked by this multi exponentiation, so it can be re be accelerated on GPU and ASIC for around like you know ten or even 100, 100 times. So it can be very fast considering the best practice of, of, of hardware. So um, it's still an open problem. There are a lot more op uh, options to explore, especially from previous courses. And if you are interested, um, reach out to us and if you want to do uh, related research and we welcome this effort. Um, and another issue around the KVM um, is more about security. So both us and the PSE ZKVM, because we are collaborating on the, the same ZKVM effort, we need over 30k lines of code. And uh, it can't be bug free for quite, quite a long time because it's just a super complex system with so many ma mathematical uh, constraints. You, you definitely will miss something or do something wrong. Um, so what's the best way to audit the KVM circuits? So in general, this is a problem of how you can audit a VM circuit based on IR efficiently. So previously there are some work I know um, for them from, from, from Stanford, like there is a Cersei, which uh, introduced some, like you can use some other IR and SMT software to kind of find bugs, but um, this is a VM circuit based on IR and whether you can, and th this is also plunk customization, whether you can audit that automatically. Um, but currently like we asked you uh, audit manually, uh, line by line to, to, to figure out some bugs, but there are some still eff some, some effort exploring, for example, formification, or some other way to audit your ZKVM circuits. So maybe you can, like it's feasible like in, in some time, but we, we don't know. So, or maybe you can start with some simple ones, which you do formification for some simpler opcodes, and then eventually extend that to your full ZKVM. But this is quite interesting and the quite uh, critical in reality, like how you kind of securely prove that ZKVM has no bug. Um, in the last section, uh, I'm going to quickly show you um, applications of the KVM um, uh, even beside the KROAP. So again, like the first application and the most motivated application is still uh, in the space of the KROAP where, um, you know, we are building a layer two solution. Uh, we can prove n transactions on layer two are valid using the KVM and we verify this proof, we generate proof off chain. We, we verify this proof on layer one smart contract. So that's the idea of, of the KROAP. So basically taking layer two transactions and general proof and some easy proof. Another application is not only on, on layer two, but also on layer one. It's called like, I call that enshrine blockchain. So the idea is that uh, if you take a look at the, the layer one diagram, why it's not so efficient? Because for each block, like most of the nodes need to do some attestation to kind of re-execute and then know the recent state. But so, so they basically need to download and execute. But what if like for each block, there are some proof proving that all the transaction of that layer one block are valid. And then all the nodes just need to verify that very small proof and it's enough instead of re-executing all the transactions. And this happens on layer one instead of layer two. So you can require that the, the, the proposer who is proposing this block to generate a ZKVM proof and then submit this on chain. But, but this is uh, like very ambitious because you are basically enshrining the whole layer one and each block will attach one, one proof. And uh, currently it's, it's not feasible because for many reasons. One is that uh, as I mentioned, like this requires the last like consensus level or Ethereum equivalent ZKVM, which is very hard to build, 
with a very large pruning overhead, and there might be some security considerations. And also because the, 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 the pruning time is super long, it's unacceptable on layer one, because for layer two, like it, it, it's quite safe because you can submit proof later, because uh, that only influences your finality on layer one. But layer two can provide some faster pre-confirmation to users ahead of time. But for layer two, layer one, if you have some kind of like 12 second block time, then you can't do this. So that's why it's, it's still a like very ambitious dream and people are optimizing that, including us and, and the PSC team at ECM Foundation are, are, are working on this, but, but currently it's still like, you know, an ambitious goal. And uh, even more crazily, uh, you can do some uh, like kind of recursive proof. I, I take this kind of dynamic figure from, from Mina. So basically the idea is that this proof is not only proving that all the transactions inside this block are valid, but also prove that the previous proof are valid. So the proof proves proof and the block. And then eventually you just need to get one proof to prove that the whole blockchain history is correct. So this is very ambitious to enshrine like the whole blockchain into a very small proof. And like, you know, one day you just hold one proof and saying that, you know, all the transactions uh, in, the, in the history of Ethereum is, is valid. So that, that's pretty cool. So, and also just to, to quickly distinguish that, you know, um, this layer one idea is different from layer two idea. So, and also it's orthogonal because imagine that layer one can generate proof for, for, for layer one block, but among layer one block, each transaction can be a proof of verification for layer two block. So basically like layer twos are enshrined into one transaction, one verification transaction to layer one, and then layer one can generate proof for the layer one block, which might consist of several verification proof from different layer twos. So that's how it's different. Like one is enshrining layer one state, one is like based on layer one, uh, I'm kind of doing scalability and making my verification transaction become one transaction on layer one. So another interesting uh, application is called uh, proof of explo exploit. And uh, so the idea here is that, uh, you know, if you think about what is ZKVM, so ZKVM is basically proving that uh, like after applying one transaction, uh, your, your, your state root move from this to this root prime. So if you make your transaction also become part of your private input, what you can prove is that you can prove that I know a transaction that can change your state root to state root prime. And uh, so this, you, you can like using this, this very like fancy nature, you can prove that um, I know a bug which can change your balance. So for example, like, you know, if, if your contract implementation has some bug, which uh, after I do a, a transaction, I can get your balance like here, leave here become zero. And then like I can prove that, okay, so after applying some transaction, which I know I constructed, I can make your balance become from like, you know, 100 ETH to zero, which means I can steal your fund from this, this solidity bug. And so you can use this proof to prove that, you know, I know a bug, I found a bug. And then like, you know, they can reward reward you with some some kind of money so that you, you will re re review this bug. Because one common problem is that, you know, if you review this bug to, to the application, they may not reward you as much as you want. And also like you can't really prove to application that without reviewing that you know a bug. So this is very like, you know, uh, used for like in terms of proving that you know uh, some transaction which makes this state tr transfer from this to that. Um, and uh, one last example is that uh, you can do some attestation. So which is sometimes called ZK Oracle. So uh, imagine that uh, in layer one blockchain, in a smart contract, you need some kind of history information and uh, you, you just can't access that um, through, through layer one. So, but, so how, how can you access the, the previous data? So one way is that you can uh, connect to some kind of other Oracle like Chainlink, they provide some kind of node and then provide this, uh, like you, they just fit, fit, fit this data directly to you. So you are basically trusting Chainlink or some other Oracle network to provide the price fit for you. But another stronger way is that you can actually trustlessly read historical on-chain data. Because you know, historical data is like this block has some, this root and this state. And you can prove that you use the state proof, which is proving for, for, for the storage, memory and, and those stuff. 
um, you, you can use this state proof to prove that, hey, at this height, uh, your, your balance is this, or the, the information you need is this, because I can prove the, the Merkle path and some other <coughs> informations. And then I can I can take this, this data and do some computation I want. Like for example, I want to perform like, I want to compute the average price for Uniswap in the past one month. So I can use it. The ZK circuit is basically computing the average average price. And then you can take the price from previous block uh, through the state proof of ZK EVM because you can prove it for the uh, EVM state tree. And then you do some computation, um, general proof, and then you verify this proof on chain so that you know that this is your result, this is your proof. So basically doing a testation or Oracle can be you read state from historical data, you do some computation, and then you verify that. So th this can be the key circuit, the key EVM, or the key virtual machine, or like arbitrary computation you can define. And Axum is, is working on this. Like uh, it's basically a ZK core processor where it's, it's, it may not be ZK EVM, but it leverages the state proof of ZK EVM and also many information of the block header. And then like, you know, core processor means this can, this doesn't necessarily to, need to be an EVM. It's just a, another processor and verify proof on, on, on chain. And uh, finally, like just a, a small advertisement for us. So a, a quick, also a quick summary for what, what I have I talked about previously. So we are building some really cool things at Scroll. Scroll is a general purpose scaling solution for Ethereum based on ZK Rollup. And we are building a native ZK EVM, which is bytecode level compatible, which is, or you can call that EVM equivalent using very advanced circularization and very advanced proof system. And we are also building fast prover through hardware acceleration. Um, and we have like a GPU in production and also proof recursion. Like we are using very advanced way to, to aggregate proofs. And uh, currently we are live on the testnet with a product level rust, robust infrastructure. And if you are a developer, feel free to, to try out our testnet, give more feedback and deploy anything you want and experience that, you know, deploying on scroll is exactly the same as, as ECM with the best e developer experience. And also if uh, there are a bunch of interesting problems to be solved, as I mentioned, there are like um, ZK engineering problem, ZK research problem for practical efficiency, and also even besides ZK, um, if you are doing some other re research around protocol design and mechanism design, welcome. Like we are looking for protocol design and mechanism design uh, like people. Um, so th thank you for, for, for listening. Um, and uh, we have a like hiring, like check out our website at scroll.io. And uh, also there is a hiring page or you can DM, DM me on, on Twitter if you are interested in joining or like working on the research together. Okay, thank you.